Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We say these words on Easter morning to be reminded of, uh, reminded of that most essential claim of our faith, that God has conquered even death itself. And if God has conquered death itself, then God can overcome any challenge or difficulty we might face in life. God heals our deepest wounds and offers us grace and love and healing and wholeness until the very end. And so it's in that hope and it's in that spirit that we gather once again to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, to celebrate this most holy day in the church year. My name is Jeremy and I'm the pastor here at Rosenberg First Methodist Church. I wanna say thank you for joining with us for this online version of worship. It is a joy and a, and a wonderful thing that we're able to be together in worship, even if we can't be together in the same room. I do want to share a couple of other quick things, some announcements and things going on in the life of the church before we get any farther. Uh, the first is that we have our food giveaway on May the 1st. Our new youth director slash community development leader, uh, Evie Serrano, uh, worked with the youth to come up with this idea. It's a simple way to bless the lives of our neighbors. We're asking you to bring canned goods and non-perishable items. And then on May the 1st, we're going to go out to the pumpkin patch and we're going to give them away to the community. It's just a simple way to bless the lives of our neighbors and to make that small little touch point in their lives so that hopefully we can find new and continuing ways to reach out and to connect with our neighbors near and far. I also wanna make sure that you know we have um, a, a new website uh, or a new page on our website for the Ezra team. Uh, we've sent out some various emails and some uh, updates and things like that in, in a few scattered different ways. Um, the Ezra team is a really important group that's working to discern the long-term future for our church uh, to kind of lay that foundation for the future of all that God is going to do here. Uh, so I want to make sure to add a page to our website. You can go to fumcrosenberg.net slash Ezra or just go to the main page. It's one of the links at the top. Uh, you'll find all the public updates, links to surveys and various things, videos, whatever it is that we uh, share in the future. That'll sort of be a central hub where you can always go back and find that information. I also want to make sure that you know we are celebrating communion today. You're invited to receive communion wherever you are. Uh, you can take Bread and grape juice are the most common elements, uh, but if you don't have that, you don't have to run to the store or anything. Just grab whatever you have that's closest to bread and grape juice, and then after the sermon, we'll consecrate those elements and receive communion wherever we are as a church family. So uh, go ahead and grab, you can grab those now, maybe hit pause on the video, so it'll be a good time. Uh, find whatever's closest, and so you'll be ready to go whenever that part of the service comes up. And last, but certainly not least, I want to remind you that Easter Monday is tomorrow. That's the day after Easter, one of the most standard church holidays we have. Our office will be closed. We want to give our, our staff and folks a little bit of time to catch their breath after Easter and Holy Week. So please reach out and thank a staff member for all the incredible work that they have done to prepare us for this Easter celebration. Uh, and we're going to continue to find new ways to be faithful and new ways to connect with one another and connect with our neighbors as we go forward. So friends, it's in the hope and the spirit of the resurrection that we come to worship our God on this Easter Sunday. It's in that hope, it's in that spirit that we turn now to our call to worship. Please stand as you are able and hear now our call to worship. Even the grave could not hold our God. Therefore, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Today, we worship our risen Lord. Come, let us worship the Lord of life. Sing the heavens and earth. 
Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as of first importance that I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. There's a piece I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is so the victory is won He is risen from the dead And I will rise When He calls my name No more sorrow, no more pain I will rise on eagles No 
Well, friends, we come to the time in our service when we're invited to share with God all that is on our hearts and minds in prayer. On this Easter Sunday, we give thanks that not even the grave could hold our Lord. And so in that spirit and in that hope, we know that there's nothing we have to hide from Jesus Christ. There's nothing we have to hide, but we can lay it all at the foot of the cross, trusting that God will receive it all and make us new. So in that spirit, let us turn now to our God for this time of prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for the empty tomb. We give you thanks for the new life that you offer to each of us. And above all else, we give you thanks that your love doesn't end with us, but that you love each of us and have called us your family. You've made us a part of your body and sent us out to share your love to the ends of the world. So God, again, renew our spirits this day. Help us to find that resurrection kind of faith to go out and be fools in love with you. To be fools in love, sharing your love and your grace with our neighbors near and far. Help us in all things to never settle for the limits of our minds or our imagination, but to know that you are by our side and that you can do all things. So give us the hope and the strength to trust in where you are leading us, to trust not in our own strength and understanding, but in your grace and love alone. In our times of trial and struggle, in our difficulties and chaos and all the many ways that we find challenge in life, be the good shepherd again. Give us strength and comfort and help us to continue marching forward. In each of those moments of joy and celebration, remind us of all the good and perfect gifts you poured out into our lives overflow with abundance, overflow with your love and your grace so that your gifts never end with us, but go on to bless the world. God, receive all the joys and concerns of our hearts this day, all those spoken and unspoken and those that only you know. Wrap them all in your arms of grace and God, through everything, draw us closer to you. It's in your son's name that we pray as we join in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel reading for the day comes from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early, on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go and tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, hide me behind your cross, so that it might be your word that is spoken this day, so that it might be your Holy Spirit that touches our lives and makes us new. Amen. A follower of Jesus looks a lot more like a fool in love than like a professional in control. And you can be forgiven if you don't recognize that in the types of Christians and the types of churches you see around us so often. Because there was this guy named Paul, and Paul wrote so many of the letters that helped start the churches in Rome and Philippians and, or, or Philippi and Corinth and in Galatia and in several other places. He wrote all of these letters that came together and form most of the New Testament. These letters are letters that deeply shape the way that we think and talk about the Christian faith. Paul was this sort of deep philosophical thinker. 
He was the type of person who wanted to work out a very precise definition of who Jesus is and what it means to be a faithful member of the body of Christ. And so often when people talk about Christianity, when we talk about what it means to be a Christian even to this day, it's Paul's letters that are quoted. And the type of writing Paul did that helps define our fundamental assumptions about what the goal and purpose of that discussion is. It's his deeply academic and systematic ways of thinking and talking and writing that shape our approach to learning and growing in Christ. We like to have these very precise belief statements and moral systems. We like to have a verse quite often quoted from Paul that backs up our little everlasting bit of information and understanding. For instance, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul writes these words in a letter to the church in Rome. And therefore, we so often like to say or think in our minds that if we really believe Jesus is Lord, if we say the right prayer, then we're guaranteed to get into heaven. That must be what this means. Or from Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Therefore, we might think, I will score the winning touchdown in my next football game. And I'll do so because, well, because Jesus. And then we have, entirely out of place is obscene, silly, and vulgar talk. Paul writes these words in Ephesians. Therefore, we say no four-letter word should ever leave our lips. And it's so natural, it's so deeply human, to love acting like we're professional Christians, like we're completely in control, like we know all that there is to know about what we're supposed to do and not do and believe and not believe, like we're totally ready to condemn all those other people, all those over there those who fall outside of the line, those pagans and those who flaunt the clear and obvious words of Scripture. We like to act like the professionals are us on the inside of the line and everyone else is on the outside. And when we inevitably fall short of that clear and precise understanding, of course, there is still always forgiveness. There's always grace. It's always ready for us after we unknowingly or knowingly fail to be those perfect professional Christians that we've decided God must want us to be. But a follower of Jesus looks a lot more like a fool in love than like a professional in control. We so often try talking like Paul and refining our systems of understanding. We like building those little boxes into which we want to fit all of life. And when we do that, we forget that long before there was any attempt at putting words on a page, there was a profoundly absurd and nonsensical claim. There was this claim that not only did God come to this earth to live our life and to be one of us, but that God in flesh was actually killed on a cross, that he was condemned like a criminal, that on the third day he rose from the dead and left an empty grave for his followers to find. The cross of Christ is the ultimate reminder that we are not in control of our lives and our futures. We are loved beyond measure and invited to trust in the one who has called us his own. It's this claim that comes long before the words and the arguments and any belief statements we could create. And it's strange then that we so often treat relationship with Christ a lot more like a pop quiz than like an actual relationship. And I will be the first to admit that when Sally and I got engaged, I did have her take a test. I wanted to make sure that she knew and agreed upon some basic facts like when and where I was born. And of course, she had to believe that I won one, not two, or not one, but not two, and actually three tennis tournaments in my life. She had to be able to say that with a straight face, knowing that I had won those three tournaments. And last but certainly not least, I wrote this 90-page thesis in college. It was part of an honors program that I was in before I graduated. And I had to make sure that Sally read the whole 90-page thesis and that she could quote from memory the five or six most important sentences within within that thesis. And of course, needless to say, she passed that test with flying colors, and the last decade plus have been flawless. Now, no, I didn't actually do any of those things. I was not uh, ever going to have Sally take a test before I would be willing to marry her. I really have to imagine that she probably would have passed most of that test. She probably could actually tell you plenty about my life. But I am also fairly confident that Sally would not be with me today if I had made her read my thesis paper, much less memorize parts of it. And if I'm really being honest, it's absurd to think that reading a book or memorizing a few of my accomplishments memorizing my basic life history, it's absurd to think that that would have had any real impact 
on the relationship we share. And obviously, in our relationship, we find out new things about each other each day. We probably could answer just about every question about each other that anyone else knows. We know that much about one another because of the life that we've built. But that knowledge comes from the life that we share together, not the other way around. We don't have a relationship because we memorize little bits of information about each other. We know those stories because of the life that we share. And it's only after we experience that life together that we start to form those stories that we tell. Those facts and those figures are woven together into the memories that give shape and meaning to our life. And everyone has a few stories that define their, rel- their life and their relationships more than any others. Some of those are the stories that we tell at family gatherings year after year. Some of those are the stories that we only share with a small group of our closest friends. Some of them are the stories that we like to keep locked away, hidden inside of our hearts. Those stories we're afraid to tell anyone. Maybe one or two people in the whole world even know about those. And as we experience life and relationship, more and more of these stories, more and more of these memories begin to form who we are and how we love one another. Sally and I have our little two-year-old son at home, and a little while back we started realizing that he began to say the word, careful, careful. And he says this anytime he realizes that he had just done something that was anything but careful. He might be starting to get ready to fall off the couch, mostly on purpose, or he might have just slipped off this little stool that we keep in the living room. And as he catches his balance, as he writes himself again, he says, careful, careful. We realized a little while back that our little daredevil no doubt had picked up on how often mom and dad have asked him to be more careful when we see him doing these things. And that repetition has almost become like this little inner voice inside of his head. Whether or not he heeds the warning is another story entirely, but it's one of those things that he knows that we want him to be more careful. And he repeats that over and over again in his head. And there are other stories, one of my own, that begins to be shared amongst our family members is something that we we quote often uh, whenever we gather with my mom's side of the family. It's a story in my own life where we had a a beautiful Christmas uh, many, many years ago where I got this video game system that my dad didn't realize was not the one that I already had. You see, I had a Sega Genesis system, which is very different than a Sega CD system. The Sega Genesis actually attached to it and kind of became part of the system together. And there was this whole big thing. It was pretty amazing back in the 1990s, that technology of those video games. And my dad didn't realize that I had the Genesis and not the CD. And so when I opened the present, the Sega CD was there before me. My dad said, I thought you already had that. And in my little, I don't know, 10 or 11 year old way, I said, no, dad, I have the Sega Genesis. This is the Sega CD. You don't know anything about my life. Now, that was obviously quite the overstatement from a little kid. My dad knew plenty about my life then. My dad knows plenty about my life now. But it's one of those stories that we tell so often and laugh about and we can, uh, we can share quite often. And this idea of Hutch saying careful in his own head and this you don't know anything about my life story really do bring laughter. They bring these moments of bonding and these little playful jabs from time to time whenever we tell our friends, whenever we tell our family, whenever we remember those particular stories. Then, of course, a little closer to home are some of those challenges that we go through. Sometimes challenges with beautiful endings, sometimes with no resolution. For me, one of those stories, one of those moments was about this one and only question that I missed on an English midterm in ninth grade. You see, the reading was the cask of Amontillado. The correct answer was dramatic irony. I don't even know how many years ago that was, but I still can't quite let it go that I missed that question. Of course, even more present than that, even deeper inside of me, is that roller coaster of infertility. So many ups and downs along the way. So many times when I felt that just indescribable stuff that doesn't feel exactly good or bad, but it sure does feel a lot. And those sorts of moments, it helps so much when other people would share their stories with me. And yet it's so hard to share those deep and impactful stories with other. And then even deeper still are those stories that I'm tempted to keep inside forever. Those feelings that are so hard to admit to myself, much less anyone else. These are usually the stories of fear or guilt or or hurt or unmet needs that lay beneath the surface of the stories that we do actually tell the world. 
You see, part of this level of story for me is that I can't let that English midterm go because there is a part of myself that is an unrelenting perfectionist. And every once in a while, it still happens that I make one mistake and I fear that I've broken the world. The English midterm is the kind of story that I used to have to laugh off because if I admitted the inadequacy that I actually felt, I might cry instead. And everyone has these stories that we tell, these voices inside of our head, some that we admit to the world, some that we keep buried deep inside. And all of those stories, these thoughts, the swirl of stuff inside of us, it begins to form the lens by which we view our life and our relationship. These become the stories that we repeat that tell us who we are. They aren't just events that happened, but they're the core memories that form our perception of ourselves. And the sum total of all these stories does far more to shape how I see myself and the world around me than anything else possibly could. No amount of academic knowledge, no clear and definitive statement of belief, no amount of practice pretending to be happy is ever going to cause a change in my life. We cannot change our past any more than we can control our future. But control was never the point. Our knowledge and our strength and our force of will were never meant to be strong enough to control the outcome. Because a follower of Jesus looks a lot more like a fool in love than like a professional in control. What changes everything is when we finally experience the love of Jesus Christ, that love that never ends and cannot fail. When the story of God's love and acceptance becomes the most important story that we tell about ourselves, at that point, nothing else will ever be the same. Even when the whole world around us seems to be devolving into a chaotic mess of fear and division, we know that God is faithful to the very end. God will set all things right and make all things new because Jesus Christ is risen. And the story of Easter is a story that redeems and transforms each of our stories after the image of God's own love. Christ came to tell the story of God's love and redemption to anyone who would hear it. He set aside a group of 12 friends to live life together. And these were the 12 with whom Jesus shared almost every struggle and challenge throughout the course of all that he did on the earth. And then upon the cross, we even receive a glimpse into the very depth of Jesus' soul as he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This story of Easter is all our story. This sure foundation upon which we stand is found in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. The empty grave is that moment when God packaged up all the stories we tell about ourselves, from the funny stories that we love to tell to the more impactful memories that we share with friends, all the way down to the fear and the doubt that we try to hide. All of it is wrapped up in the cross of Christ. All of it is transformed on Easter morning. The empty grave is God's absolute declaration that before we are anything else, we are loved, we are accepted, we are enough. Each and every one of us, each and every part of us. Through Jesus Christ, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. And when we know what that feels like, when the story of God's unimaginable and unbelievable grace and love becomes the most important story we tell about ourselves, when that happens, we start to look an awful lot like fools in love. That first Easter morning, three women went out to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus Christ for a proper burial. The, their Lord and friend had been beaten and flogged and crucified on a Friday. And now it was Sunday, and they didn't even know how they were going to get into the tomb. But they knew that they needed to go. And when they arrived at the tomb, the stone had been rolled away, and they found the grave empty. A young man dressed in white and in a robe told them, Do not be afraid. Jesus Christ is not here. He has been raised. Go and tell the others, Jesus will meet you in Galilee. And Mark tells that the women ran away in terror and excitement, and they said nothing to anyone. That's how today's reading concluded. In terror and excitement, the women ran away and said nothing to anyone. And this is actually where the earliest copies of Mark's gospel ended with an empty tomb, with terror and amazement, with the women running away with no idea what they had just witnessed or what any of it really means. At the core of the Christian faith is this absurd claim 
that God came and died and was resurrected to new life. And you can work your whole life long to try and figure out all the details. There are entire research fields set up to prove exactly what did or didn't happen. And how can we know that with certainty? And yet the spread of the Christian faith begins with this particular group of fools in love, with these three women at the tomb and then the 12 disciples shortly after. It wasn't structured beliefs or academic pursuits that convinced them to give their lives to the spread of the good news. It was knowing the power of a love that defeats even death itself that sent them on their way. It was experiencing the life of the risen Lord that changed everything in this moment. The story of the empty grave is our story, and it touches and transforms every part of who we are when it becomes the most important story that we tell about ourselves. Because before we are anything else, we are loved, we are accepted, we are enough. Each and every one of us, each and every part of us. The cross of Christ reminds us that there is no shame, there is no hurt, there is no brokenness, no fear, no failure that God himself did not embrace within himself. The empty tomb reminds us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. God's love that takes each part of the stories we tell against ourselves and offers us new life instead. God takes those stories that we hide deep inside, the stories we tell our friends, and God redeems each and every piece of that story, reminding us that we find new life in him, reminding us that God offers us a love that conquers even death itself. And because of that, we are invited to be fools in love with our Lord. We're invited to live in the knowledge that all is set right in Christ, even when all the world seems to be more and more broken each day. We're invited to embrace our weakness when the whole world seems to convince us that might makes right. And when the world tells us to lie and to hide our true selves behind our possessions or our jobs or our trophies or to hide it any way we can, instead God invites us to be vulnerable, to share our stories, to expose our wounds, because it was through the wounded body of Jesus Christ that the whole entire world finds healing. Be fools in love this Easter season. Open your hearts to the Lord and trust that whatever scars we bear or wounds we cause, no matter what it is we find inside of us, God overcomes it all. God heals it all. We are embraced by this love that conquered even the grave itself and no one can ever take that away. It doesn't matter how much you know or how well you can articulate that faith. What matters is that we are held in the outstretched hands of the one who knows our name. We're held in the hands of the one who has called us his own because Jesus Christ is risen. And because of that, nothing will ever be the same. Jesus Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the empty tomb but it was not long before that glorious Sunday morning that Jesus Christ prepared his disciples for what he would soon face. For he met with them in the upper room. He washed the disciples' feet to show them what love and service look like. And then he blessed and consecrated the meal of communion, simple gifts of bread and juice that would remind us even to this day that God is with us. We receive God's body and blood. And most importantly, we receive God's grace that endures every time we gather around this table. We gather not simply with the people in the same room as us, but with our brothers and sisters and our church family, with the church through time. All of them are gathered here at this table once again, remembering those events that led up to that empty tomb so that we can find the hope, so that we can find the endurance, so that we can find the strength to face whatever may come our way in the days and weeks and years ahead. We can face that all because we know that on the other side is still the empty tomb. And we know that because it was on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us that he took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And when that supper was over, he took a cup. He gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, friends, it is in remembrance of these God's mighty acts of salvation that we gather once again around this table of communion. We gather here to look forward to that day when we know nothing but the life, the healing, the wholeness that God alone makes possible. We can celebrate the empty tomb because it was at this table where God said once and for all, my grace will be with you. My grace is sufficient until you know the final end, until you experience the life, the joy, the hope that I want for you. So it's in that spirit, it's in that hope that we pray once again that prayer that Jesus offered that night. We pray that God would make again these elements of bread and juice into his body and blood to give us the endurance to the very end. So in that hope, let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon each of us and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us again the body and the blood of Christ, so that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry into all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, I invite you to receive those elements of bread and grape juice to be reminded once again that God is with us and that God's love and grace endure to the very end. Was it a morning like this When the sun still hid from Jerusalem And Mary rose from her bed To tend the Lord she thought was dead Was it a morning like this When Mary walked down from Jerusalem and two angels stood at the tomb Bearers of news she would hear soon Did the grass sing? Did the earth rejoice to feel you again? Over and over like a trumpet underground Did the earth sing to Friends, thank you once again for joining with us on this Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. 
Two quick reminders before we go. The first is that we have our food giveaway on May the 1st. You can bring those food donations by between now and then or make a financial contribution if you wish to do so. Just let us know in the church office or indicate that your donation uh, is meant to go towards uh, food items for that food giveaway. We simply want to bless the lives of our neighbors on May the 1st. I also want to remind you that there is that new page uh, on our website for the Ezra team, fumcrosenberg.net slash Ezra. That group is helping to lay the foundation for the future of what God will do here. So I hope you'll take a second if you haven't received those emails or haven't noticed what's going on with that group uh, to navigate to that website. You can take a look at all the information that we're sharing with you and all the information that we're requesting from you. It'll all be added to that page so that we can keep track of the many ways this group is trying to seek feedback and help offer or build towards uh, recommendations at the end of the year for how we can be the most strategic and effective church in Rosenberg, really making a difference in the lives of our church community and our neighbors near and far. So, friends, the thing I want to close with today is a simple word of thanks. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your flexibility. Thank you for your faithfulness as we have continued to find new ways to connect with one another and to connect with our God. It's been a challenging and difficult year, certainly not like any that I would have ever expected for my first year here in Rosenberg. But the hope of this day, the hope of the resurrection, the hope of the empty tomb is that God can conquer even death. And if God can do that, then there is no limit to what God can do in our lives and through our church community. So we go forth from this day knowing that God is with us, knowing that we are never alone. And may you go out in the strength of a resurrection kind of faith, trusting that God will be faithful to the very end. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.